Hi Jane, and thanks for joining us, our live live broadcast. It's really an honor for us, and today we are very happy because you are joining our live broadcast. And many years ago, actually, and maybe 10 years ago? More than. Um, more than 10 years 11. ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jane Fountain is our professor. So we learned many things from her. For example, I saw that first time a uh, YouTube to use for class. Yeah. For mm-hmm. students and uh, appreciate that maybe 11 years ago, maybe, and etc. And thank you so much today for joining. Maybe you can yes. say also something. Yes, it's, a, it's great pleasure always to chat with you, but uh, this is also an interesting uh, experience for us to to see you through uh, Skype <laughs> and yeah. to have the chance. Yeah, uh, it's always a pleasure. And as Adam said, uh, you've been a great professor and a mentor for us uh, over the years. Also, many Turkish people know Jane uh, very well. Jane visited many times in Turkey, the best friend of Turkey also. And uh, many people uh, saw that uh, Jane's behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now also. And thank you, Jane, first of all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I'm honored by your invitation. And, uh, you know, over this more than a decade that we have known one another, it's been um, wonderful for me to see for both of you the leadership roles that you're playing in Turkey and globally. And, um, you know, for a teacher to see the students become the teachers and become the leaders, it's the greatest gift that we could have. And, uh, uh, yes, I think you can see behind me just a few uh, items from Turkey. Turkey is, and the culture and the people's probably my favorite adopted country. And I am very grateful to the two of you for for helping me to get there and to learn more about the country. And the digital transformation in Turkey is uh, just as incredible as the ancient cultures. So it's uh, truly the gateway between the past and the future, as well as the East and the West. So happy to be here. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Maybe we can start with just that term, the digital transformation. We have been talking about this for a long time. You have written books about this uh, already. But uh, during this pandemic, we are moving to digital very in a very fast and very radical way. So uh, what should we call this right now, what we are going through? Is this a new phase of digital transformation or is this some kind of uh, revolution, some kind of compulsory movement? What would you say? Yeah, I think there are two two ways to to uh, think about the the pandemic. I th- I think of it first and foremost as a, a catalyst, just as any severe disruption. Let's say there was an economic depression or or a cataclysmic war or something else. It uh, shakes things up and it moves things something forward and it wipes out some other things that will cease to exist. In that way, it's a catalyst. At the same time, um, we are at the kind of beginning of this curve and not just the hype curve, but really uh, innovation transformation curve for AI, for big data. We'll we'll get to that later in the hour. um, And we are continuing. Uh, Many older organizations are just getting, you know, simple things, digital signatures, uh, functioning trans transactions online, etc. So we're doing the old information revolution. We're starting the new or fourth industrial revolution, and we have this catalyst of we need to use technology to help solve some very pressing problems right now. So that's the way I think of it. Not one thing, but a couple of different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jane, uh, how about uh, how digital transformation technologies such as AI, big data, IoT, and the new things, some things, uh, will help us in this period? What do you think? Yeah, well, the first thing, let me just say, the, um, as I think most people can see, the very fact that the Internet and the World Wide Web are as robust and pervasive 
I mean, look at us, everyone who is on YouTube right now, and uh, we can see one another so clearly, we can hear one another so clearly, maybe there is a half of a second lag. Um, the fact that with the um, extraordinary increase in use because of the pandemic, that structure is holding up around the globe is truly incredible, truly incredible. Um, and that's, you know, late 80s, early 90s, uh, early digital transformation. So I think it's, it's important to say that's our base um, for AI, for big data. We then move into the more, what people like to say, um, computing and programming replicating human thought. I think that's a little bit exaggerated. In some cases, it's better than human thought. In some cases, it's much worse. So how is it helping us right now? Obviously, in the, the very intensive search for uh, medical information, for understanding the disease, for finding the vaccine, for finding other medications that will help people, diagnostics, the ability to use AI, to use machine learning, to use data analytics, it increases the rapidity of um, innovation and developments. It allows us to pool, allows researchers to pool data from all over the world uh, in a, a more powerful way than before. Um, more broadly, AI, big data are critical for the global supply chain, for the global movement of money, finance, logistics, as well as research for environmental information, from early warning systems about climate change, drought in sub-Saharan Africa, a place we don't think of as advanced technologically, but they are using some very advanced AI for farming, for medicine, um, to you know, the biggest banks and financial organizations in the world. Um, we see this transformation playing out or it's playing out and it's invisible to us. We just know that we can do things that we couldn't do before, but we don't realize that it's because uh, the mapping on our smartphone is using AI. We just know that it's a good map and it tells us where to go and how to get there. Um, so there's a, a, a tremendous amount going on. I will say that smaller and medium-sized firms uh, we had a symposium in Toronto, Canada in January on national strategies for AI. And actually the head of Microsoft, public sector for Canada, a former civil servant was there and he was talking about how the uptake, the adoption, the transformation process for smaller and medium firms, medium sized firms is taking longer. Why? They don't have as much money. They don't have the human capital. They are not the first movers. They are the second movers, the third movers. So will the pandemic make them move faster? Uh, I don't think so. I think it might make it harder for them to innovate because they need money. They need uh, human capital. We will see. Maybe there are some things we can do strategically through different government grants and other incentives. Um, so there are a lot of ways that the transformation is playing out, but I would say, yes, absolutely. Uh, this is a big transformation. How about from the perspective of individuals or the citizens, what, uh, what does all this mean for, for the uh, ordinary people, let's say, uh, in terms of social effects and of course, technological effects in terms of the way the technology is now a part of their lives? What would you say about this? Yeah, here too, we have so many different types of developments. Let, let me start with the positive and then go to what now for what, 30 years we have been calling digital divide because in the ancient history of the information age, we said, well, the digital divide will take care of itself. Prices will be lower. Everyone can buy the smartphone. Everyone can buy a laptop. And yes, prices are lower, but if we think about systemic and institutional effects, if we think about people's occupations, about their job prospects, um, 
This is a long disruptive process. So what about people's social lives? Internet of things, the smart home. Um, I have to be careful about products and companies because we are on YouTube for the world. I don't have a Siri in my home or anything like it. I don't want it to be listening to me. I, but this raises the general issue of, uh, I guess you could say, to what extent do we want to trade off some privacy for convenience, privacy for having a digital assistant that knows everything about us, where we're going, that's going to help us, who's getting the data. These are, these are important issues. Uh, what do we do with that data? Who, who owns that data? If it's your personal data, is it really your personal data? Um, I think these are big national, international conversations to have. At the same time, these things make our lives so much more convenient and organizationally. Just yesterday, I was working with one of my colleagues who this year, he's in Washington, he's in the Congress, he is working on a congressional committee. They are trying to figure out how we get hundreds of billions of dollars to the people who need it. They are finding when you take this money and you put it into old state and local government IT systems and old bureaucratic systems that just don't have the capacity to handle this kind of volume, it's a problem. And we're not going to just throw money at people, obviously. We can't just send checks through the mail. So we're thinking about legislation that will, as part of the response, as part of the uh, relief and helping people, will also give money to state and local smaller governments to upgrade their systems. Uh, because I think we know uh, if we don't do that, they can't upgrade their systems. So this is kind of inside baseball. But for the average individual, um, people are having neighborhood meetings online with their neighbors because they can't get together. People are having birthday parties with the family because they can't get together. The grandparents are visiting with the children online. Some of that was happening, but I think because of the, the pandemic, again, it's a catalyst for more people to jump on to these kinds of online engagements. And then they find, oh, okay, it's not so hard. And it's not so bad. I actually see my my colleagues, my friends, my and we had a good conversation and we got work done. So whether it's in the workplace or in the social life, um, there are, of course, tremendous benefits. Um, we don't want people to be left behind in all of this. And um, these people are often invisible. One of the things we see in the U.S., uh, many of us can stay at home and do our work at home. Uh, but there are people who have to go into crowded places, not just healthcare workers, but other people. We are having the news right now in the U.S., people in meat processing plants. They work very close together. They are getting sick. Um, what can technology do for them? Well, certainly diagnostics to see when someone is sick, to isolate them from other workers. There are a lot of things that could be done, but uh, interestingly, ironically for this pandemic, you know, the we knew these answers hundreds of years ago. Isolation, quarantine, social distance. It's not high tech, it's low tech, but we can combine that with some very high tech um, parts of solutions. So there are many ways that this these technological changes in the midst of this pandemic are changing individual lives. Uh, Jane, also, you, you had an amazing uh, experience about the education sector, in the education sector. Uh, you gave many lectures and also you worked many universities, University of Massachusetts, Harvard, etc. before. And also, uh, we are wondering, because education, education is changing. Yes. And uh, after the COVID-19, uh, actually, we will see that maybe new life, new social life, new business life. Also, and we are wondering uh, how will citizens need business life and education habits change? And for example, many students are wondering graduation ceremony, what will be happening? <laughs> also, uh, course and lecture will be different. 
maybe future. And uh, what, what, what do you suggest for us? What do you think about it? Uh, what do you say about the future? How uh, much? How much will uh, will be permanent uh, after the? Hopefully, this is over. Yeah, this is. You know, here's another way that the pandemic is really a catalyst to. Many faculty, you know, we can resist change if we want, or we can be innovators if we want. We have a lot of uh, we have a lot of liberty and freedom, and hopefully, we want to try new things and be in the foreground. So, uh, I'll just start with the personal. This spring, of when uh, we sent all the students home, I think in in March, early March, if I'm remembering. Um, you know, that was it. The chancellor said, OK, classes are online. We're not discussing whether people want it or they're ready or they think they can do it or will the students like it. It's like this is the only way that we can continue. So this was a necessity. Will it continue? So first of all, um, at least in the US, education is very expensive and um, more and more and even before the pandemic, we were thinking in terms of blended learning. There are some things that you cannot do except face to face. I don't think sitting in a classroom <laughs> is one of those things. Um, and uh, many of us have had the chance to be the teacher or the you know trainer or giving the talk. And many of us have the chance to be the learner. So we can sit in both chairs, so to speak. Um, for many students, it would not be possible for logistical reasons, maybe for family reasons, geographic reasons to go to a university, be in residence. That's a great luxury. And I think after this pandemic, that would be even more of a luxury. Some small schools, I think, are going to go out of business. They won't like some small firms. They will not be able to hold on and then recover. Um, I wish I was not saying that. I wish it weren't true, but I think it's um, uh, I think it's obvious if you do the analysis and you extrapolate. So in education, I think we want to think uh, starting from preschool, at what age? I mean, we ask this question, and you have a young son. At what age do we want to put uh, you know three year old, four year old for nursery school? The fact is most of them are already interacting very fluidly and comfortably with devices and it has not harmed them. They are still interacting with humans and they have friends. And, um, for something like a graduation, uh, this is hard because this is, uh, you know, lots of hugging and your family and multiple generations are there. We are doing it. Uh, University of Massachusetts virtual graduation this year. The chancellor has said, look, we're going to have a real graduation, the traditional kind, but we can't have it. And you hopefully you all come back next year and do it the traditional way. But we will celebrate online. Just this morning, I was recording short congratulations and we're putting those together into uh, videos for our students. We asked our students to rent their cap and gown if they want to and wear the cap and gown uh, and invite their family to the event. We will see. Uh, we will see. Just today, this morning, we had an award ceremony for our undergraduates in political science. It was it meant a lot to them to be recognized, to have the faculty there. We did uh, kind of a foolish thing. Maybe after each award, we all clapped on the screen. We unmuted ourselves. We, and the director, who is a computational social scientist, said, "You know, I thought about getting a um, uh, a tape of uh, clapping and play that tape. You know, like a disc jockey could after." He said, "But I decided we should have real clapping, and uh, it was very nice." And people were putting things in the chat box, you know, congratulations, and we wish you the best. Um, I think there's a lot more potential here, maybe, than we have imagined. 
And uh, again, this epidemic, if any silver linings we can find, we should find them. It's pushing us forward to try things in, in uh, new ways um, for education as a whole. So to recap, blended learning, uh, some things done face to face. If it's possible, other things are online. I had a student in one of my classes um, who connected with us from India. He won't be traveling to Massachusetts. We hope he will come in September, we'll see. But he was able to start his classes remotely. You know, businesses have done these meetings, video meetings for a long time, and everyone should be able to do them. Um, there are many benefits, not the least of which is, uh, again, like this, recording it. So someone wants to watch the recording later, um, they can do that. Uh, if they want to watch me five times say the same <laughs> thing, they can do that. Uh, and we can all do that. Um, um, how about the social media usage that we know that it's uh, uh, on the increase, of course. Uh, do you think this period will uh, create new uh, social media, new forms of uh, social media in terms of its use or new applications? Or what kind of new uh, trends are you observing in terms of the way people use social media? Yeah, well, I, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, certainly, I think there's greater use of social media, and I'm sure there are data already because we've been in this uh, now for at least March, April, so we have now a couple of months of data. Um, I'm sure, obviously, people are developing new applications that relate directly to the, the pandemic itself. Um, you can measure whether you are coming within six feet or two meters of someone using uh, your smartwatch or an app that you could download to your phone. Uh, people are coming up with loads of apps, many restaurants and cafes. I would imagine it's the same in Turkey. You are, they're doing more delivery or you can go pick up your food. Uh, a lot of it's being done through, through apps. I mean, these are kind of mm -hmm. basic uh, apps. It's nothing new, but the prevalence and the variety and the number and types of people using them, I think will, will greatly increase. We need to, to watch out for, uh, for hacking for there are a lot of people out there, you make something that looks like a government website, you know, you need information on unemployment and you go to this website, but it's not an authentic website and you're putting in data that you, I mean, garden variety, cybersecurity problems, but they tend to increase during these periods as well when people are looking for answers or they're newer users. So digital literacy is important. Um, the new, new, new things that are coming out in social media, I don't know. We need to ask Microsoft what is the answer. <laughs> Jane, actually, um, uh, we know that you had written a book, Building the uh, Virtual State, Virtual Government, 2001, yeah. approximately 19 years ago. <laughs> and you, you, you mentioned that about today's concept, actually, maybe, because a government's uh, adaptation to the technology these days is incredible. Every government is announcing the new smart uh, government's uh, vision, new uh, e-government strategy, new digital transformation strategy for the citizens, etc. especially these days. Yes, and yes. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that maybe 19 years, maybe 20 years ago about this one. And will the role of the digital transformation increase in the public administration in the post-epidemic uh, period, what do you think? Uh, um, it's been interesting uh, to observe these developments now for uh, about 30 years. Let me say that I think, uh, and I find this with students and executive ed in discussions as well, I think we learn a lot by looking back to the first industrial revolution, to industrialization, 
first of all, the very long period of time over which that played out, about 50 years, the way that it played out differently in different parts of the world at different times and in different ways, um, and the not only tremendous benefits I don't think any of us want to go back to a pre-industrial society, but also extraordinary dislocation and disruption in people's lives. If we are a macroeconomist or historian, we may say, right, this was a disruptive period for people. And you read it and you say, okay, it was disruptive. If it was a 20 year period that someone and their family and their community did not have work, did not know what to do, uh, that's the disruption of entire lives. Um, I think knowing that we can do better in this period. Um, how does PA change? Um, I don't think there are any government civil servants left or public managers saying, you know, no, I'm not interested in technology. We had that discussion in the 90s. Will people adopt? Won't they adopt? Um, forget it. That's over. Um, interestingly enough, uh, lots of professional schools, I think, still are not teaching their students enough about um, uh, the government of the future or even the government of the present. I taught a new course in the fall um, uh, called The Future of Government. And we looked, we spent the whole semester just looking at cutting edge examples. Um, in order to give students an idea of this is this is the state of the possible right now. So when you go to whatever town or state or region or country that you go back to to work as a public manager, as a civil servant, you should know that this is what is possible. And then you can think about what is the path to to get us there. Um, of course, public private partnerships are incredibly important. Tech leadership is going to remain in the private sector. That's where things move fastest. It's where the innovations come out fastest. But no one can understand really the intricacies of government as well as public administrators if they are strong public administrators. So we really don't want to just say, no, go get a computer science degree and then become the town official because you might be good, you might not be good, but you will have a lot to learn about government and politics. Um, it, when we watch the variety of uh, digital governments and public administrations around the world, we see lots and lots of uh, different types of possibilities from the tremendous advances in Turkey uh, that I had the privilege to learn about to places like Estonia, to South Korea, um, Obviously, the big countries, um, each country has its own path to follow. And uh, we're really fortunate to be able to compare across countries, across regions. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done. Jane. Now, both national and international meetings are held through online platforms, like today, Skype uh, meetings. And will online international meetings continue through online platform in post-epidemic period? What do you think, mostly? You know, this is a is another, yet another interesting area. So these are these are really wonderful questions. Um, if you if you think about, uh, I, I do not think that the the amount of uh, business travel to various conferences will come back to the same level. For one thing, if yes, we are all thinking about the pandemic, but at the same time, we want to be thinking about climate change. When you really look at the the cost, in not just the cost of your plane ticket, but the cost of the fuel. <laughs> of having planes, you know, going everywhere. I love them, I love flying, especially Turkish Airlines, big shout out. <laughs> uh, I should show you my plane, it's in the office here somewhere. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
it's not about the experience of travel. And so I don't want to, you know, I'm obviously not going to affect the stock market. I think that companies, universities, individuals will be asking themselves, do I need to physically travel to this meeting? Imagine if every international conference, and I don't know why we've, well, I do know why, why haven't we been videotaping all of the talks at all of those conferences? Um, one reason, of course, is you pay a fee to go to the conference uh, to hear the talks. Uh, maybe you can still have a fee for those talks. Um, let me say this. If someone goes to a meeting, another country, another region, they travel to get there, um, they stay in a hotel. Yes, there's a cost to that. There's a risk to that if there's a pandemic. It's not just the uh, sessions, the panels, the talks that they will go to that will be informative, maybe transformative. But mm -hmm. during the coffee break, they're going to meet people they never met before. They're going to have conversations they would not otherwise have had. Why? Because you're mixing people in a, a new and different way. Maybe they're going to go to uh, a dinner or lunch with people they haven't talked to before. And it's in those more informal spaces at these meetings where trust is built, where people learn a little bit more about maybe another organization or another country or another culture or another person. And the social capital that is built through those interactions, that is harder to build online. Although I have to say, just experiencing really the, the, the quality of our interaction, we already have social capital, we know each other. I think there's probably potential there that we have not appreciated. And maybe the, the research and results of global teams could tell us a lot about that potential. So I think the being able to hear lectures, hear panels, online, yes, we can certainly do that. Um, but some of the experiences, mentoring, introductions to people you might not have met, the really the social part is, is something we should think about uh, if we're going to have an online meeting, how can we accomplish that? Well, last week, I got an invitation um, from someone. They are organizing a, a virtual summit. Mm. Okay. Uh, also, uh, they are giving the networking area, they are giving the lunch time, they are giving the networking, one-on-one -on -one meeting, they are organizing everything. Like, uh, it's really interesting and only, for example, the one ticket around quite uh, hundred dollars. And uh, But if you want to go to abroad, the hotels, accommodation, ticket, and conference registration, etc., maybe more than um, 10 times, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, really a new platforms, new area, new life is coming, it, it seems. Uh, we will see that, uh, I cannot say anything because we are also uh, still thinking what will be happen. Uh, we will live together and we will see it together and we will see that. Jane, thank you so much. I really appreciate that for your time and uh, uh, end of our and um, live broadcast. Uh, what do you uh, think, or what do you uh, want to say for Turkish people, for world, etc., for citizens, for parents? Um, uh, we want to listen to you. Uh, so, uh, let me just say, um, you know. Turkey and many countries like Turkey have been around for thousands of years. They have seen everything. They have experienced everything. They have experienced much worse than this. So in the United States, you know, we are kind of like babies. And uh, we have a young country. We don't have uh, so many of these experiences to draw from. Uh, we need to be positive. We need to be thinking about how we use this crisis as a way to move forward, as a way to move, make things better. And, uh, and we will. Um, when we are in the moment, it seems like it will never end. But of course, if we think about the broader sweep of history, yes, it will end before we, we know it and we will move forward. We will be stronger and we will be smarter. And uh, 
technology will play a big part in this. So thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and to visit with old friends. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's always great to chat with you. And as always, you are very optimist and also giving us your po positive energy also tonight. Thank you very much. Be safe. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Yes, stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>